Good evening. Happy Sabbath. We're going to continue our study um, reading from A.T. Jones articles, General Conference Bulletin, 1893, on the message of righteousness by faith, or the three an third angel's message. And uh, before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the Sabbath hours, uh, for the blessings of this past week, for the trials and the difficulties that you have helped us through. Um, we know, Lord, that we see around us pain and suffering, sorrow. And we ask, Lord, that we can help those around us that, that need help, that we can lift up those that, that are discouraged, and that we can share um, the message that you have given us as Seventh-day Adventists, the message of Christ and his righteousness, that we can reveal his character to others. We ask this, Lord, especially in the time that we are in, in the world around us, we see uh, the anger, the fear, and um, we know, Lord, that um, the events that are unfolding before us are prophetic. And we just ask for a clear sight, an ability to understand them, and to share these things with others. We pray for this movement. We ask that we can accomplish the task that you've given us to do. And that we can be faithful in the little things that you give us each day. We pray for those who are struggling with their health. We pray for Dwight, and that you can help him to heal. And um, we ask, Lord, that we can receive your Holy Spirit, that we can see our darkened hearts and minds. We can see the sin that is hiding that we have hidden from you. We ask, Lord, that we can confess our sins, that we can repent and turn from them, and that we can uh, encourage others by our lives. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Now, where we were in Jones' study, I was doing a lot of reading at the end of the study uh, last Friday evening. Um, and Jones was, of course, addressing the issues that are going to arise, our commitment to Christ um, that is needful if we're going to pass this Sunday law test. That is, if we're going to stand in the Sunday law, we can't have connections with the world. Our sympathies cannot be with the things of this earth. Our sympathies have to be with the things of heaven. Right. So he says here, then is it not plain from these words that the people who will stand faithful to the third angel's message, faithful in allegiance to the law of God and his Sabbath, will have to do it without any calculations of life itself coming into their account. Isn't that so? Now, I find it interesting here, um, his word of the use calculations. Uh, back um, in December at, in the, in November of 2020, when uh, this movement uh, was trying to address what to do about July 18th, um, Larry Lesher had brought up a, a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy talking about calculations. And he had tried to apply it to actually setting of time, which if you read in the context, it's the same context that Jones is using here. Calculations in the sense of planning, that we so somehow can know our future, that we can plan out the details of our life um, and, and, and know what's coming, you know, in our, in our personal finances and things like that. That's what he's talking about. Um, so when it comes to the calculations of life, that's man's ideas, man's goals, ambitions. But we have to submit ourselves to God and trust 
that he is going to take care of us. So he says another thing, when all earthly support and protection are taken away, when all questions of reputation, which the world thinks so much of, are taken away, when all questions of property or business of any kind are taken away, when all questions of life are taken away, how much is left? How much of worldly things or worldly interests is there connected with that man? When he has reckoned up the account and has set aside all considerations of earthly protection, even of mercy, mercy or justice, when he has reckoned up the account and set all questions as to what men think or say upon the subject, reckoned up the account and set aside all questions as to whether property can be had or whether he can buy or sell or do this, that or the other, reckoned up the account and set aside all questions of calculation as to whether his life shall be dear unto him or whether it shall come into the account in any way when all these things are cast out of the account. Then how much of the world is in that man's calculations? The audience responds, none. Now this reminds me of um, some friends of mine. So uh, they moved to Warburg I think it would have been probably, I think it was about 1997 or something like that. And um, uh, they wanted a place out in the country uh, because they believed that uh, Y2K was coming and that uh, that was going to be pretty much the end of the world. And so they set about living in the country and all of their energies were placed upon providing creature comforts for when the time of trouble would come. So the idea was, you know, to be off the grid, you know, that was sort of what they were looking for, because if, you know, Y2K came, they'd be safe. And of course, they wanted to have lots of food stored up. Um, they weren't quite preppers, you know, they didn't have firearms and ammunition, but, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with living in the country, believe me, that's, where I spent most of my life uh, and would rather spend it is in the country. Um, but the idea is that they were focused upon the things of this world, really, because we know at that time, do, do, are we going to have to provide for ourselves? When we can't buy and sell, is God going to provide for us? Yes. Mm hmm so I'm not sure why we would worry about it. Now, I know that Ellen White says that we need to move out in the country because there is a period of time in which we need to be able to work and to be free. Um, and, and so, yeah, so, so there is a time, you know, that if, if we were living in the cities and the big cities and, and things start to go south, I mean, things could be very difficult for us. And especially if we have families. Um, definitely I would not, not have raised my children in, in the city or even a town, uh, raised them in the country. Um, but we know that we can't count on those things to protect us forever. And, um, I know that I can, I can survive to a certain degree, um, when I have to flee, but without God, I wouldn't be able to survive. I don't think there's any way any of us could uh, make enough calculations uh, to provide for ourselves in the time of trouble. There's no way we're going to be able to escape the persecution other than to rely upon God. <clears throat> so Jones goes on, then has not the Bible, the word of God, brought every Seventh-day Adventist face to face with that reckoning and called upon him to make that calculation and that decision. And the audience says yes. Then it is time for every one of us to begin to think very seriously indeed. So remember, Jones believes the Sunday law is imminent, that he's in Revelation 8, 18, verse 1 to 3 at least, or maybe verse 4 and 5 as well. So he believes the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, that the Sunday law is going to happen. And that we're going to need to depend upon God, which is a very wise uh, thing that he's saying here. I mean, this is the reality. 
The Lord will never allow you or me to be shut up in a place where he does not expect us, expect to take us out a great deal more gloriously than if we had never got him in there. The Lord does not call upon you or me to enter upon the course that calls for the forfeiture of anything, but that in the place of which is forfeited, he will give us that which is worth infinitely more. When he calls upon us to stand in allegiance to his truth, which shuts off from us all considerations of earthly support or protection, then he simply says, here is all the power of heaven and earth for you. All power is given to me in heaven and earth, and I am with you. Here is the covering of the Almighty drawn over you. Come with me. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Be not afraid. That is his word, is it not? Let us read it a little more fully so as to get the direct reference upon it. In Isaiah 51, we find a prayer that the Lord tells us to speak to him. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O arm of the Lord, awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab, Egypt, he puts in brackets, and wounded the dragon? Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. How are they going to go to Zion? With singing. Then let us begin it now. Why the Lord doesn't want us to go with our heads bowed down and skulking around as though we were afraid to be seen and had no place in the world? Look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh, said Jesus. We belong in this world, every one of us, until God is done with us. And Satan himself cannot do us any damage until the Lord is done with us. And even then, he cannot do us any damage. Let us go on our way with singing then. Let us be glad of it. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of man, which shall be made as grass? And we profess to believe in God. We are standing by the law of God, and we have the Sabbath of the Lord that reveals to us who God is, that he is the true God, he is the living God and everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and by his word, he can bring worlds into existence, and by his word, shake them to pieces. And here are some men that are just like grass and will vanish in a little while. And they say that if you do that, you shall go to prison. And if you persist in it to the last, you shall be put to death. And we get scared at that. Why? Isn't the Lord right in asking just such a question as that? Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? That is, that is what he wants to know. Is not that a fair question? I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? and of the Son of Man, which shall be made as grass. Don't you see the very insult of the idea that anyone who professes to believe in the Lord should act in that way? The Lord says that isn't depending on him. Let us read some more. And forgettest the Lord thy maker that hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Thank the Lord. Just now, it is so that the fury of the oppressor is about to break forth. Well, why should we fear before him as though he were able to destroy? Was not Elijah attacked and driven out and had to flee for his life? But when he had gone a long journey and was weary and lay down to rest and fell asleep from weariness, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and touched him and said, Arise, Elijah, and eat. And he found a cake, bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. Thank the Lord. Was not Elijah perfectly safe? Brethren, isn't it worth being driven out in order to have an angel do that? Which would you rather, not be driven out or not have the angel come and stand by you like that? Let us be 
Let us not be afraid then. Elijah lay down and went to sleep again, just as Peter, when he was condemned to be killed. Well, why not? What was the use of worry? Elijah lay down and went to sleep, and the angel came and awakened him the second time and ministered to him. Again, he said, arise, Elijah, and eat, for the journey is too great for thee. Brethren, God will give us bread for the journey. If the journey is too great, he will give us bread twice before we start. I tell you, brethren, it is time to begin to trust the Lord. Let us do it now. He says so. In another place, he says, bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. It is so. Now, when we think about righteousness by faith. So, um, you know, Colin did a presentation um, last Sabbath, which uh, we looked at a little bit before we started the study here, um, which was about uh, faith. Um, the study was entitled, you know, The Just Shall Live by Faith, I believe. I'm just going to look at it here. Yeah, the Just Shall Live by Faith, uh, one of his series, what he calls Daniel's Last Vision. And so the just shall live by faith. Now he's saying that our faith is to be centered upon uh, the prediction that we have regarding the prophecies of Donald, Donald Trump. But when we look at faith, what is faith? Is it that some particular thing is going to happen some way that we understand it? Or is it that when things don't go the way that we expect, that we still trust in God? Which is it? Or are they both true? I'd say, I'd say the latter. You mentioned the latter part. But no particular thing, no. Yeah, because one of the things that we know about the end time events is that we don't know about the end time events. We know some things, but how things are going to unfold, especially for each of us personally, what role we're going to have, what trials we're going to face. Uh, we don't know what those are. And we're still going to have trust to trust God in spite of whatever we see. What, what I've seen that God has been showing us is our dependence upon him. That is, we need to see, we need to have the Holy Spirit. That's one of the things that Jones starts with from Ellen White's statements. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to show us our sins, to show us our dependence upon God. And the 144,000, they don't trust in themselves or in anything except God. Or any person. Yeah, any person. So, so when we look at, at faith, um, I don't see that faith is included in this idea of, well, I'm going to predict some event or I'm going to believe some prophecy is going to happen in some particular way. What, I, what faith is, is in God himself, trusting that God knows what we don't know, that he sees what we can't see, and that when the powers of this earth are being exercised against us, that God is more powerful. We are powerless. But God is powerful. And that even in, even in our death, if we are to be a martyr, God's name is glorified. So how many, how many of us had faith in, in the July 18th playing out in Nashville? I, I, well, <laughs> a lot of us. Yeah, well, and, and, and so, but we still need to understand that God was leading in that. Oh, I know that. I mean, I mean, as far as uh, uh, Nashua getting blown up, you know. But but we weren't dependent upon that happening. I mean, Jeff was quite clear that it may not happen. Right, but I'm saying a lot of a lot of people did, and they got disappointed. Yeah. But what we did know is that God was leading us in making that prediction and in giving that warning. Yeah. Right. We have all the evidences of it then, and we still have those evidences even more so now. Uh, yeah. Um, 
So to trust in God, even when we can't see, I mean, that's when you need trust and faith. I mean, if I'm on a path and the path is all bright and sunshiny and it's wide and broad and, and you know, there's no wind or anything, I don't have much need to trust in God. But if the path is dark and it's uncertain, I'd need to trust in God. You know, if I only have light sufficient for my feet, I have to walk in that light. I have to trust that God is leading. And that's what God's been teaching us. Um, I'm going to skip that verse there, though. Um, Now, then he's going to say, then about the reputation. Let that go. He gives a character, a character which... He himself wove from infancy to the grave that is complete in every respect. And he says, take it and put it on and you shall come to my wedding supper. That is the character. That is the covering that he draws over his people so that the plagues cannot touch them. And no power of the enemy can overcome or defile it. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61, 10. Thank the Lord. And about the life, when he calls upon you and me to take a position in allegiance to his law, which will forfeit our lives, that will put our lives in jeopardy so that some earthly power would deprive us of it. What then? Well, he simply says, let that life go. It will vanish away in a little while anyway. Here's one that will last through all eternity. When he asks you and me to take a course of allegiance to his law that will put into jeopardy and forfeit this vapory, vanishing mortal life, he says, here is eternal life to begin with. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. This is the record that God hath given us to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Has he given it to us? He that hath the son is going to have life sometime. The congregation says no. He that hath the son hath life. How in the world can we have the son without it? Is Christ dead? No, he is alive. So when we have him, we have the life that is in him. Now, of course, this idea about our lives going to be over shortly. Um, we all know that that's the case. And, you know, in the building that we live in, there are some people who, um, they know that their time is short. They're old. Um, you know, some people with cancer, one guy in particular. And he's having a hard time dealing with it. And, um, but what do people have to hang on to? If you don't have Christ, you actually have nothing. But the thing is, we can think we have something because we have some things, but those things are going to vanish away. They don't last very long. Just see what it brings to us when a man who professes to have Christ does not believe that he has the life which is in Christ, which is eternal life. What kind of Christ is he? A Christ with no life in him? No, Christ isn't dead. It's not that what has been rung in our ears over and over for years by the voice that has been speaking so long for the Lord. Brethren, Christ is not in Joseph's new tomb with a great stone rolled at the door of the sepulcher. No, he is risen. He lives. He lives. Tell it with tongue and pen. Then as he lives and does nothing but live forevermore, when I have him, I have a living Savior. He that hath the Son hath life. What kind of life is in him? Eternal life only. Eternal life only. Then when I have him, I have the life which is his. And that is eternal life, just as he said. But as Brother Haskell has brought before us in his lessons, we cannot have that life without yielding up this one. In doing that, we need Jesus Christ. 
That was the lesson today, don't you see? Yield up this life and you will get one that is a great deal better. Now is the time, but if I cling to this life, when it is gone, what have I left? Congregation, nothing. Therefore, the man or woman who has only this life to start with need not start with the third angel's message because when the test comes that this life is at stake, he will stick to it. That's the danger. A man can't go through what the third angel's message is to go through with only this life that he has. He can't do it because it is all he has and he will stick to it when it is brought into jeopardy. But he will let this life go, count it worth nothing, and take that life that measures with the life of God, that life which is the life of God, will have a life that can never get into jeopardy. That man is safe. He can go wherever the message calls him. For he who is the life of the message is the life of him who will maintain his allegiance to this message. Then, always bearing about the body of the dying of our Lord Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death. Is, that not, is not that so from this time forth? Is it not a living truth from this time forth that the, those who stand by the third angel's message are always delivered unto death? Just as certainly as the apostles were themselves, always delivered unto death. And that is in all our calculations. We live face to face with it all the time. Then, brethren, instead of the power of earth that we cannot depend upon, and which is decidedly against us, God gives us the power of God. Instead of reputation, God gives us character. Instead of earthly things, earthly riches, houses, lands, property, business considerations, or any of the kind, uh, God gives us Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and ye are complete in him. God hath appointed him to be heir of all things, and we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. He is heir of all things. We are joint heirs. Then how much belongs to us? The congregation says, all things. Then what have we? All things that God has. Then, we, then are we not rich? Instead of this life, which the powers of earth would take away. God gives us his life. When he asks us to take a position in allegiance to him and his cause, the Lord simply says, here is eternal life to start with. Then brethren, has not the Lord fully armed us? Oh, then let us have on the armor of God now. That is what is wanted, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. That is where the Lord wants us to stand, and that is what he wants us to do. And he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's where we are. Now, what are you going to do? Choose ye this day whom ye will serve, and which course you will take. Now, one of the things as we go, as we think about what, um, because he says that this is sort of a summary, right? This uh, message number six, he was sort of sum, summing up or giving uh, an overview of what he had already presented. And, and the idea that he presented is that uh, we definitely need God. We need the Holy Spirit. And he marked that with the events that had occurred in his day in 1892 and 1893, that he believed that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down and that the Sunday law was imminent. But now he's going to connect this message, which we should all understand as Seventh-day Adventists, that the message of righteousness by faith is connected to the third angel's message in, in particular, and that is in order to stand in the Sunday law, we need Christ's righteousness. Now, that doesn't um, mean that the first and second angel's messages aren't important or that they're also not connected with righteousness by faith because they are. The first and second angel's messages are, 
are needful. You can't have the third without the first and the second. But when we talk about the Sunday law that's coming, because that, that's what this movement has been about. And we can see back then, when we made the chronological connections between this history of Jones and our history, we can see that they're connected, that Jones' history is typical of our history. We can see that the message that's needed right now is the message of righteousness by faith. And, and that's why we're studying this. But we know that righteousness by faith does not consist in um, simply doing the right thing. It, it includes that. There's no doubt about it. But it's not just about that. And so sometimes people take righteousness by faith and they make it as, well, if you do this wrong thing, you know, if you correct this habit, then you have righteousness by faith. But sin is a symptom of a disease. It shows us that we're not connected with God. And to overcome sin, we need to be connected with God. And righteousness by faith is about trusting in God in spite of the fact that we are powerless. So we can see what Jones is presenting here in presenting the third angel's message in connection with the Sunday law is he's showing clearly what righteousness by faith is. It's not some theory about how to stop from sinning, but it's a, it's a reality of, of knowing God and having confidence in God. Now, what would be the role of the first and second angel's messages in that regard? So we have the third angel's message, which righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, that is in reality, right? worked out in the life, developed in the character, because that's where we're going to stand in the test to show Christ's righteousness to the world. But what is the role of the first and second angel's messages in connection with righteousness by faith? Why are they needed? Why can't we just get to step three without step one and two? Because you, because you cannot have a first without, or a third without a first and a second. Okay, so what are the first and second doing to bring us to the third? Because of preparing, third, preparing. So the third step is that we have complete trust in God, no connection with the world, no trust in self, no trust in man. But we can't just get there, right? So what are the first and second angels messages doing to help us get there? It's building our character. Okay, it's building our character. Well, that's true, but how does how do they build our character? I mean, the character that we have is going to be the character of Christ, right? As Jones is laying out, this is something that Christ has woven. It's a garment that has not one thread of human devising. Yes, Chris? Christ is revealing himself to us in these stages so that we can stand in him okay so so when we go through this prophetic movement when we go through this um reform line we're going through a three-step testing prophetic message now the first two steps are going to be needful in order to get to the third where we have christ's character where we can stand at the sunday law and, and we can see how, as we go on this journey of these messages, and we can see this in, in the study of Abraham. Abraham's a man of faith, but did Abraham always trust God? We can look back and see the faith that he had. He, he left you know, the land that he was in, he left his father's house, he left his kindred, he went into the land that God showed him, and God gave him this covenant. But we can also see the failings of Abraham. His 
stumbled like the rest of us. But it was a process. When he got to uh, Mount Moriah and is offering up his son Isaac, he now has this experience that he can trust God in spite of his feelings. Chris, you have a comment? Well, yeah, it's a, pro it's a progressive change that takes place in us. Yeah, and, and sometimes it takes a long time. I mean, when I first became a Christian, I, as I've said many times, I had no idea of what God was asking of me. And that if I knew, I wouldn't have begun that journey. But I began a journey, which in retrospect, I can see all the blessings. But if I had saw the difficulties that would be ahead of me, I don't know if I would be able to take that first step. The Millerites were brought through an experience. And that experience included disappointment. It included self-sacrifice. I mean, the story of the journey, of course, we know Ellen White's vision with the, uh, you know, the wagon train and, and going up the mountain uh, pass and uh, the cord that came down and continues to get larger and larger and, and taking their shoes off their feet and the blood on the rocks and all those things. We know about that story. And for me, as somebody who does backpacking, I understand the story quite well. I understand, um, you know, a false summit where you're, you're climbing up, you're going over a pass or you're climbing up a mountain and you think you're near the top. And then you get to a certain point and you realize the top is a lot farther than you, you thought. And that's the Christian experience. But we have to continue on this journey. We have to have a trust that God is leading us. Now, you know, we've been in the morning studies looking at uh, um, the story of Gideon, and we've been making a comparison with the story of Gideon to the movement in the present time. And we know that, you know, Colin has made a prediction, which, uh, which I believe the chronology is correct, but the prediction, what he was expecting to occur, does not take into account all that God has shown us. It doesn't mean that Colin is some bad person or that um, what God has shown him, because I believe God's shown him these lines, uh, that, that there's something wrong with them. I think they're correct. It's the interpretation of the lines that's the problem because they don't fit into with everything that God has shown us in our experience. And Odilio has done uh, something similar with the pandemic. So we have the Trump prediction, we have the pandemic, and these two messages uh, have been presented to this movement, which, which will fail. That is, the Sunday law is not going to just grow out of the pandemic. We're not going to lead to uh, the pandemic intensifying. It, it's going to be something that's that has prepared. The governments have, in a sense, done a test with the pandemic. Can we control people? But when it comes to the Sunday law, it's going to be about the Sunday law, right? It's not going to be about the pandemic. It's not going to be about vaccine mandates. It's going to be clearly about the law of God. Correct? Yes. And, it's, and, it's, and it might you know, be tied to environmentalism and things like that, but it's still going to be about the law of God, right? It's not going to be something where it's not clear. Right. So, so we know that um, God has been leading this movement. He's leading us down this path. Hello, Stephen. I know it's really late for you. Welcome to the study. Um, so God's been leading us down this path. And... Um, the question is, are we going to do what he's asking us to do? Jones is laying it out pretty clear. 
But in some ways, if we knew a Sunday law was just around the corner, like within a month or two, in some ways it would be easier than what's being offered us right now. Right? To know your journey's over, even if it's going to be difficult, in some way is easier than to know that still there's a great deal of journey ahead of us, a great deal of difficulty, that we need patience. I, I don't know how many of you have ever been backpacking, but I can tell you that you can go I've through. Been, I go backpacking sometimes. Yeah. So, so you know that when you're at the end of a journey, you can put up with a lot more pain than you can at the beginning of a journey, correct? Yep. Because <laughs> you know it's going to be over. But if you start out on a journey and, and you're hurting early on, uh, you have this desire to turn back. But when you're at the end of the journey, you're not going to think about turning back. And so some ways it would be easier to be at the end of the journey. But God is giving us a task that is to give a message to the Levites. Seventh-day Adventists are not prepared for the Sunday law. If we look at what Jones has just laid out for us, that how separated we need to be from the world, are Seventh-day Adventists in that situation, or are they totally tied to the world at the present time? Many are tied to the to the world, some greater or lesser degree. Yep. And, the, and their hopes are based upon that the time is going to continue. I've talked to many Adventists. Christ isn't coming back anytime soon. You know, we need to, we better get comfortable right now. Right. But we know that Christ is coming back soon. But there's a work to do before that. <clears throat> okay, so this is going to be Joan's seventh message. So we're going to start on this one. We won't get through it. <clears throat> Some of the folks wondered last Friday night whether I was not making things rather strong. But I think after what Brother Porter read from the testimonies just now, all will agree that it was just straight. I do not want you to think, brethren, that I'm making up things to say here just because it is you. If I had been preaching since last Monday night to a people who never heard of Seventh-day Adventist, of a Seventh-day Adventist, nor the Third Angel's message, I would preach to them just exactly what I have to you, because I do not know what else to give now than the Third Angel's message. I do not know what else to do to people wherever I do preach than to bring them face to face with their need of the power of God. So I'm not saying anything to you yet that I would not have said to anybody. It might come after a while that I shall say something to you that I would not to other people, because maybe some of us have been doing things that other people would not do, but that is the only reason. Now, let us glance again at a summary of the lessons we have had. We have found that there is nothing that will hold up us up in this time but the power of God. And we have found that nothing will satisfy us, nothing will do for us but the character of God. And we have found in the matter of means and business affairs, so far as this world is concerned, that we cannot depend upon any of these anymore, but only upon the things that God gives. We have found that as to life itself, we cannot count on that anymore. The only thing that will satisfy, the only thing that we can depend upon, the only thing that will meet our need, our demand, the demand of the people who will now stand for the Lord, is that life that is better than this one, the life that is eternal, the life of God. Well, then first, nothing will support us but the power of God. And where do you find the power of God? Where do we find the power of God? In Jesus Christ. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That is what he is. Where do we find the character of God? in Christ. And where do we find all things, the great things of God? In Christ. Where do we find a better life than this? The life of God in Christ. Well, then, what in the world have we 
to preach to the world but Christ? What have we to depend upon but Christ? Then what is the third angel's message but Christ? Christ, the power of God. Christ, the unsearchable riches of God. Christ, the righteousness of God. Christ, the life of God. Christ is God. That is the message that now we are to give to the world, is it not? Then what does the world need? Christ. Do they need anything else? No. Is there anything else? No. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. As I said a while ago, if I'd been preaching to a people that had never heard anything about the third angel's message, if I'd been preaching to them since Monday night, that I, I would preach just as I have, and bring them face to face with Jesus Christ, just as we have. And by the way, there is a whole congregation of infidels that are just in that place, waiting now to give me an invitation sometime to come and speak the next time. And that is what I, I am what I am to tell them. A whole congregation professed to be nothing but infidels have given me the opportunity to speak to them three times already. And I've spoken on these things just as they are right before men's faces. And they have already asked, what are we to do? And one of them said, well, he has told us all these things and it is all plain, but he has not told us what to do. Well, said I, I did not have time to tell you what to do tonight. Give me a chance and I will tell you what to do. They said, all right, and I will do it. When that time comes, I propose to tell them just what to do. I propose to set before them just what I have set before you that if they're going to oppose the church and state movement, they've got to set aside all ideas of earthly dependence. They've got to set aside all thoughts of riches or possessions or anything of that kind, and all ideas, all ideas of thoughts of life, and they can see it. And then I shall tell them they cannot afford to do that unless they get something better. And the thing better is Jesus Christ, and they must have him or else they cannot stand at all. Why, brethren, the world is ready to hear the message. When we get the message, the world is ready to hear it, and they will hear it. So if we think of our situation, what do we see in the world around us today? Now, in Canada right now, we're having these hearings dealing with uh, the truckers. So they're looking at um, uh, Justin Trudeau's appeal to the... Uh, whatever they call it, it used to be called the War Measures Act, but they have the new name for it, I can't think of it, but um, Emergencies Act or something like that. And um, so they're having a hearing because it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, Trudeau overstepped his bounds, that he suspended constitutional rights with, without proper cause to do so. And um, so some people look to the world, you know, if we could just get a better government, you know, if we could just get, you know, Trump back in power in the United States or, or, or something could happen, we could get rid of all these problems. But we know as Seventh-day Adventists that that is not going to do, that this world is heading in, in one direction, and that's not into God's kingdom and to depend and trust upon the powers of this world to protect us or to give us justice or mercy, that's not gonna happen. So I, I think what Jones was saying and what he was presenting was he was presenting to some infidels what's happening with the Sunday law question, what's happening with church and state. And they're asking the question, what are we to do? Don't we have that question always asked us when people are looking at the situation in the world? They're wondering, what, what are we going to do? And, and most of them have a solution. Well, somehow we rise up and you know, we protest or we write petitions. And Jones is quite clear that the time to writing petitions is past, right? And, and we can see that clearly in our day. Can we not? Yes, agreed. Yeah, we can't be calling on the powers of the world to think that they're going to bring us justice, that they're going to set things right, because they're not. They're already on a course 
And, and Jones marks this course back in 1893, 1892. And, and, and he's in a sense, right. He just doesn't realize what had to happen. And he doesn't realize the condition of the church, that the church was not ready for the Sunday law to come. That the Sunday law comes in response to a people that reflect Christ's character. God can't bring the Sunday law crisis if he doesn't have the people that are going to stand in that crisis. Correct? Exactly. And so God has brought us through a message, the first, second, and third angel's messages. Now, we're really presently, to some degree, in the second angel's message, depending where how we look at the line. But in, in the big scheme of things, you know, the world's in the second angel's message. We're still approaching this Sunday law. The second angel's message arrived. Now, we're also in the third angel's message ever since October 22nd, 1844. So... You know, it just depends on where you're zoomed in on these lines. But we know that our work is still the work of the second angel's message. That the message that we're giving to the world right now is the second angel's message. Now, in doing that, we're also giving the third angel's message. Because the third angel's message is righteousness by faith, as is the second and as is the first. But we're having them prepared for the empowerment of the third angel's message. And that's going to occur at the Sunday law. <clears throat> now, you know, I've been teaching righteousness by faith since... 1983, maybe. I was baptized in 82, December 25th, 1982. Um, and I wrote my first paper on righteousness by faith a few months after I was baptized and made copies of it, gave it to the elders and the pastor of the church that I was in. And I continued to study that message, Romans, Galatians, um, which is where I first really started after I became an Adventist, studying those books. And then, of course, um, with the, uh, the upper room studies, began studying the prophecies. Because as an Adventist, when I was baptized, I didn't know much about the prophecies. I understood about them, but I didn't know much about them. And so in the upper room studies, we studied Daniel and Revelation, Leviticus and the book of Hebrews. But the message of righteousness by faith, the nature of Christ overcoming sin, was my message all through the 80s into the 90s until I ran into this message in 2010. And then I realized what I was missing. So what was I missing before this message came? What is this message providing that I didn't have? Prophetic and chronological understanding. Okay. And why was that necessary? We need to increase our faith, have faith in the way that God is leading us okay. so that we may place our entire total trust in him. Yeah. So the, so the thing about what Jones is saying, and I'm not trying to put down Jones here, but we know the history of Jones and what happened to Adventists after 1893. And the problem is they had the theory of righteousness by faith correct. But it's one thing to talk about the power of God and to experience it. Has this movement experienced the power of God? If it has, how have we experienced the power of God? I 
I mean, when we draw those lines, when Stephen draws those lines and puts them up on WhatsApp, and we see the structures of prophetic chronology, are we seeing the power of God? Yes, we are. When we look at these dates and how they connect, especially as they connect to us personally, and I know not everybody necessarily has a date that that they can connect in 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 some of the ways that you know Dwight or Iran or Stephen and my and myself can, but we can we can see that these God is leading, not just in the dates that happen on these lines, but in events in our own lives. Are we not experiencing the power of God? And if I'm going to trust in the power of God, I must know that it's there. I cannot just exercise faith by willpower. I can't just decide I'm going to have faith. I have to go through an experience. We all know that our promises are like ropes of sand, right? If we're going to have that rope that's going to carry us across the chasm, that's going to be something that comes as a result of a continued walking with God, of a learning to trust him. You know, many Christians start on the journey with a wagon full of goods. But they don't continue on that journey. They can't give up the wagon. But in order for us to give up the wagon, to walk with God by faith, requires a knowledge that God is leading us. I mean, this is so clear and should be so clear to this movement. The thing that I really fear, and I don't fear many things, but the thing that I really fear for this movement is that people are going to give up having not examined the evidence of how God has been leading us. And we've seen it happen on the December 6th, 2020 declaration. These were people walking off the foundation. They were not willing to leave their wagon. They weren't, they didn't want to look at the evidence that God had been leading them this far. So this message of righteousness by faith that Jones is giving us it is a true message, but it's incomplete because we can talk about the power of God, but it doesn't mean we have it. And, and this was the problem that Jones had. And he became discouraged when things didn't go the way that he planned, because even though he talks about the calculations, did he not really have calculations about what was going to happen? That Christ was going to come back soon, that the Sunday law was imminent? That the church was going to be united in this work, and yet he just is finding that the church is his enemy. That they're the enemy to the message, to the truth, to the message that he was given. And that discourages him, and he takes it personally. And we're going to look at that as we go through these studies. <clears throat> some of his, uh, did he write of some of his discouragements? Um, well, right yes, we're, we're going to, to deal with what happened to him. So in um, uh, the 1909 General Conference, the last one Ellen, one Ellen White attended, I think it's in the 1909, um, Jones presents, right? Um, and, and he writes it in a booklet, which we're, we're going to go through. We're going to go through what happened to him and where he was at in 1909. And Ellen White writes about, about it. She doesn't write about it directly. It's in nine testimonies. Um, 
but she writes about it. She speaks, I think, two days after Joan speaks, and and we will look at that. So, but we we can't look at Jones the way the church does because what does the church do with Jones? Jones failed. So what does the church say? Georgia R. Knight wrote a book called 1888 to Apostasy. What is he saying about Jones there? They castigate Jones. Yeah. They say his message must have been wrong. Right. right. Even though Ellen White says this is a message from God. No, the message must have been wrong. July 18th didn't happen. The message must have been wrong. Right. Christ didn't come back October 22nd, 1844. The message must have been wrong. That's what so many want, want to present. But they don't understand the power of God. They don't understand how God leads. Jones was given a message, and that message was truth. It was righteousness by faith. It was the third angel's message in verity. At least that's what it was to be. But Jones didn't have enough dependence upon God or trust in God to go through the trial that was before him. He wasn't expecting the trial. If the Sunday law had been imminent, Jones would have been able to go through that Sunday law, possibly, right? But the trial that was before him was something that he could not have expected and something that he could not have endured. And we have before us trials that we don't expect, but we need to endure them. We don't know what's going to be happening with this movement. We have this hope that this movement is going to go to the upper room, and I believe that's the case. But going to the upper room is not a simple experience. It's not a simple exercise. We don't really understand what the disciples experienced in order to bring them together, to humble them, so that they could be there on the day of Pentecost, having the Holy Spirit poured out upon them, that they could act as completely different men than they had been prior to their experience. And the question is, is that going to happen to us? Are we going to be transformed? Because we're not at the end of our journey. We don't have Christ-like characters. We can easily look at others and see, well, they don't have Christ-like characters, so I must be better than them, so I'm okay. But that's not enough. Just seeing that somebody else doesn't have a Christ-like character isn't going to help you have a Christ-like character. Being better than someone else isn't, doesn't mean you're like Christ. In some ways, you're not really better. Because if you're just judging your brother, in a sense, you're worse than him. Because you're an accuser of the brethren. You're actually satanic. So this is, this is what we have to face. This is what's coming to this movement. <clears throat> so Jones goes on. Well, then Christ, the power of God, Christ, the wisdom of God, Christ, the unsearchable riches of God, and Christ, the life of God. That is what we are to preach. Well, what is all summed up in one thing? What expresses it? The gospel, right? And we know that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. What is it to preach the gospel? It is to preach the mystery of God, which is in Christ, which is Christ in men, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What has God given to us to give to the world but the everlasting gospel to preach unto every kindred and nation and tongue and people? Is not that what the message starts with? And then when men will not receive the everlasting gospel, nor worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters, whom did they worship? The beast and his image. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And then the third angel's message says that they will worship the beast in his image. So that now men worship the beast in his image, or else they will worship God. 
That is settled according to the message as it is. And the time in which we are, the only thing that people in this world can worship is him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters, or else the beast and his image. There's no halfway place. The three messages are simply one threefold message. In the special testimonies is one that is addressed to the brethren in responsible positions. We read on page 15. While you hold the banner of truth firmly, proclaiming the law of God, let every soul remember that the faith of Jesus is connected with the commandments of God. The third angel is represented as flying through the midst of heaven, symbolizing the work of those who proclaim the first, second, and third angel's messages. All are linked together. So Jones is now seeing this, right? So he's He's understanding it at least in part, right? That we have these three angels' messages. So Joan says, so that the opening thing, the one thing of all, that which covers all of these messages is the everlasting gospel. So here we can see the everlasting gospel. It's not just the gospel. It's the everlasting gospel this three-step testing prophetic message. Now we have referred a time or two to the Jewish church as an illustration of the situation in which we are. So what is Jones going to do here? If he's taking the Jewish church as an illustration of the situation in which we are. He's doing what we're doing when we're taking the church, the Adventist church, as an illustration of the situation in which we are. Correct? That he's setting line upon line. Yeah, it appears that way, yes. We found that there, that we found there that that church turned its back upon God and joined itself to Caesar in order to put Christ out of the way and to execute their mind concerning him. Then the Lord called out of that church and nation all who would obey him, all who would serve him before the nation was destroyed. And he did that work by those few disciples that believed in Jesus when he ascended to heaven. They had been with Jesus three years and a half. They had preached. They'd even perform miracles in his name. He had sent them to preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so important was their message that if the place did not receive them, they were to shake the dust off from their feet before they left. Yet before they could preach the gospel, which he gave them to preach, when he ascended to heaven, he said, tarry ye at Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Would not we have thought that their being with Christ three years and a half, learning, uh, hearing him, loving him, studying him, and with him, having been taught by him this length of time, and having even preached, it would naturally be supposed that they were fitted to carry the gospel to the world? But no, said he, tarry ye at Jerusalem. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye at Jerusalem until ye be endued with the power from on high. So we can see the parallel here quite clearly. We've been studying, right? We've been following this message. But we're not fitted to carry the gospel to the world, are we? No, at this point, no. And this movement has been tearing at Jerusalem for a while, has it not? Isn't this the message? No more public evangelism? Isn't this what Jeff was trying to teach us? That we were unfit to reach out to others? And that we first had a work to do in ourselves, and then we had a work to do for the church. And then we have a work to do for the world. How much power was there enlisted against them and the message they were to preach? 
all the power of the world for the church of God, the professed church of God, that whole nation had joined itself to Caesar, whose power filled the world. All the power of the world was allied against them. The professed church and nation of God had allied themselves to power and had arrayed it against God and the name of Christ. And yet this Christ, whom they had crucified and whom they had done their best to take away from the world and the minds of men, his disciples were to go and preach that very name and that very person and that faith only in him could save them. And they had to preach this in the face of all the power that the world then knew. Well, not very long before that, only about 12 days or two weeks before Je Jesus told them this, Peter got scared at a girl and denied that he knew Christ. There was a girl that began to say, I saw you with the Galilean. No, you did not. No, I don't know him. He came closer to the fire and she got a better look at him. And she said, you're one of them. No, I am not. No, I never knew him. And then to prove it, he cursed and swore. Was he prepared to face all the power in the world? No, he needed to be acquainted with a kind of life and have hold of something that a girl could not scare him out of before he could face the world, did he not? And Jesus has told them all, you will all forsake me and flee this night. No, we will not, they all said. And Peter said, though they all forsake you, I will not. Jesus said, before the cock crow, you will deny me three times, Peter. And though I should die with thee, I will not deny thee. And so likewise said they all, but they forsake him, didn't they? Well, then we see that so far as themselves and their work was concerned, and so far as the power that was supposed to their work was concerned, we stand exactly in the situation in which they stood at that time when Jesus ascended to heaven. Now, Jones is standing in that situation at that time, and we are standing in that situation at our time, right? We stand exactly in the place where all the power of this earth is allied against the message which we are to give to the world, and therefore we need, just as they, to be endued with power from on high. So it is a literal fact that we stand exactly where they did when Jesus ascended to heaven and told them to tarry until they got that power. So when he ascended, he said, as recorded in Acts 1 verse 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Then what were they to tarry for? For the Holy Ghost. What was he to bring them? The power. What was to endure, endure them with power? I think it should be endue them with power. The Holy Ghost. Now, I do not need to read the references from the little special testimonies and from gospel workers that Brother Prescott read here, which are on the same things. How that the words of the Lord tell us that just as the disciples were doing that, so we now should be doing the same thing how we should be gathered in companies praying for the Holy Spirit, and how it required 10 days of seeking God to bring them into the place where they could offer effectual prayer and receive that which they asked because they asked it in abiding faith that would receive what was asked. And don't, nor do I need to read again those passages that I read from testimonies and manuscript, that when the people of God individually seek for his Holy Spirit with all the heart, there will be heard from the human lips the testimony that fulfills that word. I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So Revelation 18, verse 1. And prayers are ascending daily for the fulfillment of this promise, of being endued with power. Then we have the word of the Lord that prayers are ascending daily. Are yours amongst them? Are mine amongst them? Now the day is going to come. And the last prayer that will be necessary to bring that blessing will have ascended. Then what? It will come. The flood will burst and out will pour the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. Now notice, the word is, as prayers are ascending to God daily for this promise, not one of those prayers put up in faith is lost. There is the blessedness of that promise, you see. Yes, when God tells us to pray for a thing, why, that opens the door wide for us to pray for that thing with the most perfect confidence that we shall receive it. When he tells us to pray for a thing that throws open the door wide 
and there's not a single thing to hinder that prayer from finding a lodgment there. What is his word to us? That not one of those prayers put up in faith is lost. Now we know that, you know, he started with the testimonies in the spirit of prophecy regarding the need of the Holy Spirit. And we know that we need the Holy Spirit. Now God is giving us the Holy Spirit in the messages that he has given us in the light that he has been shining upon our path. The question is, are we willing to receive it? Because the light that's been shining upon our path is a light that's revealing to us our sin. Correct? Yes. Agreed. Now, we, like, yeah, we like to make it be about the sin of others, right? That's what we would like this light to do, is to show the sin of others. But we know that it's not. It's showing us our sin. Well, one of these days, the last prayer needed will be lodged there, and out of the blessing will be poured, and who will receive it? Now, I remember when, and I've mentioned the upper room here, the upper room, not the one that, that the disciples are in, but the Bible study in the attic of my house. And we spent a lot of time praying for the Holy Spirit. We were new, young Adventists, wanting to understand Adventism wanting to have the power that is revealed in God's word. And I don't believe that one of those prayers was lost. God has continued to answer those prayers. Those prayers don't necessarily come the way that we expect. The answers don't come the way that we expect. Those whose prayers have ascended to God for it, I do not care whether that man is in the center of Africa and that outpouring is here in Battle Creek, he will receive it because by our prayers for it, the channel is open between us and the source of the blessing. And just as certainly as we keep that channel open by our prayers, when the spirit is poured out, it will reach the place where the prayers start from just as sure as can be because the channel is open. Then, brethren, could we possibly have more encouragement for the prayers which we see by everything around us we must offer? Could there possibly be more encouragement for us to offer those prayers with all the heart and with perfect confidence? Now, in asking that question, I'm, I'm not sure what he means by seeing everything around us, maybe what's happening in the world. But we know that what we see, that's the encouragement, to some degree, is the trials that we face. What we have been through, our experience, is what's giving us encouragement. There is a word in Gospel Workers that I want to read, which speaks plainly upon this question. Speaking about the apostles, it says, they were waiting in expectation of the fulfillment of his promise and were praying with special fervency. This is the very course that should be pursued by those who act a part in the work of proclaiming the coming of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. For our people are to be prepared to stand in the great day of God. Although Christ had given the promise to his disciples that they should receive the Holy Spirit, this did not remove the necessity of prayer. Why, of course not. That opens the way to prayer. When God has not promised a thing, I am free to. Am I free to pray for that thing? No, because we are to ask according to His will. But when God has promised, should I do anything else than pray? That is the beauty of it. They prayed all the more earnestly. They continued in prayer with one accord. Those who are now engaged in the solemn work of preparing a people for the coming of the Lord should also continue in prayer. The early disciples were of one accord. They had no speculations, no curious theory to advance as to how the blessing was to come. Now, the thought I am after is this. They had no speculations, no curious theories to advance as to how the promised blessing was to come. That means us now. So again, Jones is paralleling himself with the disciples. We have 
we are to have no curious theories as to just how it is going to come. If anyone begins to say, oh, it is coming on as, as the day of Pentecost, the sound of it as the rushing mighty wind will be just so-and-so. The tongues of fire will look just so-and-so, et cetera. And so settle it thus and say, that is the way it is going to come the next time. And thus I shall know when it comes. The one who measures up this matter in any such way will never receive it. What they needed was to get their hearts right before God. And it was none of our business how the Lord would fulfill his promise. He does not propose to have us dictate to him and say, the Holy Spirit must come in such a way or else it will not be the Holy Spirit. Then if you have had any theory about it, just annihilate that theory tonight and let your theories always stay annihilated. We have no right to fix up in our minds the way the Lord is going to do things. That was their situation. That is our situation. And brethren, just as certainly as the promise was fulfilled to them, so certainly it will be filled now, fulfilled now to those who are praying for the same thing. We do not know how long it will take. Now, if we think about our situation, we have promises in God's word, right? We know that we're in a line that's leading to the Sunday law. Do we know how that's going to come about? If we, if we look at the pandemic and we say, well, the pandemic's leading to the Sunday law, so this is how the Sunday law is going to come. We're going to have this happen and that happen. What have we done? Have we set the conditions for God, how he is to act? Yes, definitely, yes. We need to be prepared. We need to recognize that this message is to prepare us. Not so that we know exactly how things are going to come about, but so that we can have the character that when things come about differently than we might expect, we will be able to know that the Lord is leading. It's fine to say that the just shall live by faith. And so we have to believe that the Trump prediction is, is, is going to be fulfilled in such and such a way. But that's not faith, is it? No. Faith, is, faith is when we don't see something and we trust God anyway. And the fact is we don't really see anything. We have no idea what God is doing in a way. We have no idea how events are going to unfold. We only know that God is leading us to the upper room. We have to go to the upper room if we're going to do the work that God has given us to do. And we don't know how we're going to do that work. We have no idea of, of how it's going to come about. All we know is that it'll be evident that the Lord has taken the work into his own hands. That it's not going to be man's machinery or man's planning or man's calculations that are going to complete the work. Christ's character will be seen upon his people. His Holy Spirit will be speaking through them. People will be drawn to Christ, not won by argument, And yet, what do we do as human beings? We prescribe how God is to act and how he is to work. And we call that faith. But it's the farthest thing from faith. Judas had that kind of faith, right? He thought that God was supposed to act in a certain way, that Christ was supposed to overthrow the Romans, that in order for that prophecy to be fulfilled of the Messiah, they needed to have a conquering king. And I think all the disciples had that idea, too. Yeah, yeah. But the, the disciples were taught. They were able to see that. Judas became discouraged. He tried to force upon Christ the crown, but instead 
he led him to the cross, correct? Yes. So the question is, are we going to be the disciples in the upper room? Are we going to be Judas? Are we going to be willing to set aside our ambitions, our pride, our ideas about how things are going to come about? Or are we going to just trust that God is working? And are we going to continue to pray that God can give us the Holy Spirit, not just so that we can have power, but so that we can see our need of him, that we can see our sins, that we can see the defects in our characters that have hindered us in working for God? That's really the question that everyone in this movement has to come to face to face with. I mean, I'm extremely thankful for all the light that God has given us, all these dates and numbers and structures. But they will mean nothing if I don't see my sin. They'll mean nothing if I don't trust in God in spite of what I see around me. This is righteousness by faith. So we're going to come back to this um, tomorrow afternoon, two o'clock Mountain Standard Time. Um, for now, we're going to have to close with prayer. Any final thoughts? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord for the light that has come from your word. We are grateful for the messages of A.T. Jones that you inspired him to give. We are thankful, Lord, for the parallels in history that can allow us to see where we are. We're grateful for how you lead us, lead us in our personal study, how you lead us in, in this movement, how you have directed our course. Help us to continue to walk as you lead, that we can watch and wait, that we can measure the time, that when the time is past, we will know that it is the time. Help us to trust in you. Be with each person. May your angels watch over us this evening. And we ask that you can bring us together again tomorrow morning to study your word. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.